John Epping, it's been a while. When did, I don't know, I haven't seen you in a few years since like Trillium whenever. I think the Trillium camp is definitely with uh, working with the, the kids uh, a couple yeah. years ago. But uh, for, for everyone out there watching this now, uh, John is someone I probably met when I was like 15 or something stupid in junior curling. Um, he probably beat me a lot. I don't remember, but I assume I lost most of the games we played against you. Um, uh, but you've done everything uh, in, in the 20 year gap since then uh, from, you know, winning grand slams, uh, being a top rated CTRS or whatever the system is um, going to multiple briars after hating Glenn Howard for a few years <laughs> there. Um, but so just thanks for coming on and talking with us, man. Oh, this is awesome. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate it. Um, so tell me this year, you, you guys just got the briar in, in time before COVID went crazy. Um, was it any different at the briar? No, we were, we were lucky that, uh, things hadn't really hit what we thought hit Canada. Now looking back, we're like, we wonder how many people had COVID at the Briar actually, especially when you're in the patch, which, you know, curling fans uh, are well aware that is the, is one of the biggest parties probably happening around. And um, yeah, it's, it's hard to believe the last time that uh, I was social hanging out with people. Uh, it hasn't stopped me having from having beverages, that's for sure. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's been a, a few months since I've seen anybody. That's, um, one of the things I always joke with people like comedians, like they find out I'm a curler, right. And they have a go at me for whatever. I'm like, relax. We started drinking at like 15 and curling. Like that was <laughs> like, it's so ingrained in Canada and in the sport of curling. It's, I mean, even now, uh, the sport has become so, um, like there's money. Um, like everybody is, is into physical fitness, but yeah. the patch is still a thing. Oh yeah. Like, I think the big thing is what's always carried through. I mean, yes, curling, we don't have the, you know, the big beer bellies and the cigarette, you know, smoking a cigarette as we're throwing the rock. I think you know, we've seen the fitness side go, you know, probably 2009, 2010 start to really change. But I think one thing, and I've always said it, uh, especially when I do, you know, any type of, uh, you know, news related articles is that that connection between the athlete and the fan uh, that connection that you have, interaction you have in the patch um, is, is like no other sport. You don't have that access to the top rate, top rated athletes in the other sports like, you know, baseball, NHL, like you don't have that. And that's something that curling has. And I hope it's something that will never, uh, will never die off. And I know, uh, so a good buddy of mine, Scott Zachary, um, Nova Scotia. Yeah. I don't know if you know Scotty. Um, I do very well. Yeah. So I went, I played juniors with Scotty when I lived in Nova Scotia. Uh, he was on our podcast a few weeks ago with his brewery and, and clothing company. Um, but his team's a little different than yours in that, like, they're not going to slams. Um, but just because of a lot, some of its geography, some of it's just, you know, where the bases of curling are, uh, in Canada, but you know, you go to the slams, you're like one of the top teams in the world and get treated like a rock star at the briar. Scotty, is got a full-time job, does a million other things, still goes to the briar and is a rock star for that week, right? It still does that thing where, um, I don't want to say community curlers or club curlers because they're not that. Um, no, but, no. But not like those top slam teams, they get to, they still get that for the week. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's that's what's also great about about the briar. And, and I mean, you know, the Grand Slams when you go there, it's, it's, it's not like the Briar as if it's set up that way. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Slams are run by the players. You show up, you're, you kind of play. The, the curling kind of has it has all the carpets rolled out and the, uh, you know, the extra umpires, the, you know, and of course they're, they're putting them in, you know, buildings that have, you know, holding six, seven, eight, nine thousand people. So, I mean, you know, it's got that different feel. And yeah, you do, you do feel like a, a rock star, especially it's like, and think about it when you go to the trials, that's like, it's like the briar on steroids, right? It's just absolutely massive as you're playing for such a, a big carrot as, as the Olympics, which has definitely changed, has changed our sport and where you're starting, I think, to see that gap kind of go from, you know, not, as you said, not saying that the team Scott plays with, but they don't travel as much, the cost, they don't have the time to where some of us play you know, a lot more and put that effort in. And that's where you're starting to see that maybe the gap just kind of grow a little bit. 
And you think with all these these rule changes and residency rules, it's going to make it worse, isn't it? Yeah, like I I I think that well, that's what's yeah. And, it, and it's at a tricky point. Curling was so happy that you know that we're in the Olympics. What well, that's great for curling, but then why would you try and just put your best team together in that province versus when you can put your best team together in Canada, right? So. It's a fine line. Uh, the Briar, don't get me wrong, it has the history, right? When I was a kid, there were, we weren't, you couldn't go to the Olympics. That was we it. Olympic sport yet. The Briar, the Scotties, that was the history of the game. And that's what, now with the Olympics, the extra care. And I mean, representing your country with not just curlers watching, curling fans, like every sporting fan. And even if you're not a sporting fan, you watch the Olympics, right? Yeah. That's what brings, I find brings, brings everybody together. Um, so I think we're getting to a tricky point where they're just trying to keep some of the curlers happy where you can have two maybe out of province players or you have the, the they're, they're calling it the grandfather rule where if you played out of this province, you can play out of that province the rest of your life, no matter wherever you live. Yeah, curling at that, we're at a, we're at a tricky spot with, with, I think, the briar. It's a crossroads for sure. It, I don't, it, it is. I don't know if you know this, um, but my master's degree, I wrote on curling. My thesis was about curling and the Olympics. So what I did was I studied because I, I did a co-sports management community recreation thesis on um, the effect of curling uh, going to the Olympics and the prof professionalization of this, how that trickled down to the professionalization of the uh, community curling club. No way. And what I found was that it didn't. What actually had an effect was drinking and driving laws, uh, smoking laws, and like stuff like this. It's bananas. That's what actually came out of the study. It's totally not shocking, right? Yeah. If you're afraid? But, yeah, that's not, that doesn't surprise me. So many old guys were telling me stories. They're like, no, like the Wednesday men's league, they'd have to close the bar at one, but the bartender would leave 12 beers on the table and say, lock up when you're done. And like, I was like, oh my God. And like, like they're like, we don't care about, not that they don't want to see the sport succeed, but they're like, it doesn't affect our Tuesday night curling league. And then like, there's all sorts of other things that came in, right. In terms of, um, you know, dual working households. So, um, a lot of the men's leagues are struggling because dad has to be a parent now too. Yeah. <laughs> and just rock out to the curling club. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. It's his turn. Like some, like some of my buddies say, well, it's my turn to babysit tonight. It's like, that's actually your kid. You're not babysitting, but whatever, whatever you, whatever yeah. makes you happy. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's just, a, it's just a weird world. Right. So, and you know, TV between like the slams are owned by Sportsnet now. Right. And curling was always CBC and TSN. Now it's all over the place. Everyone's fighting for their piece. Um, yeah. And the way you look at it, yeah. I mean, and, and too bad there. I mean, they, they, they need to work together a little more curling and, uh, or, you know, sports net and, and uh, the, you know, curling Canada likely. And I think though, like curling is in such a great spot with TV. The coverage is so good. If you're a sponsor right now at an event, you know, you're all over the ice. It's constant all the time. Like the TV coverage right now for curling, and especially now, I think after uh, with COVID in the fall, people are just dying to watch sports. And some sports are, you know, uh, him and Hanna about coming back where curling is going to be, you know, front row center. And I, I think that curling's had a big advantage coming back too. And, and we can kind of cater. I think we can kind of get through these you know these physical distancing rules and and uh be that whatever six feet apart on the ice i think we can make that work too yeah i think it'd be harder at like a local club but for like a competitive game you could you could find a way around that especially in the rinks maybe you put three sheets instead of four and figure it out maybe maybe one sweeper we one have one sweeper. sweeper anyway now like what's it what's yeah. it matter skip and third don't need to hang out the third can go down the skip like you know, it's, uh, I, I think it can, uh, I, I think it can work. So yeah, I, I think curling, you know, from a, from a TV sport right now is just growing like crazy. And, and the numbers are, the numbers are there. We get to see them from, you know, from Sportsnet and TSN and, and it's, uh, it's great. It's great to see that people love to watch curling. Here's the, here's the thing though. Here's why, why aren't you guys, cause you've seen the numbers. Mm -hmm. Why are you guys, aren't, why aren't you guys getting paid for those numbers? Yeah, like, you guys have uh, like CFL numbers on 
TV. Like you draw big numbers for those big events, like big million plus numbers on some of those big events. True. And yeah, I think there still needs to be some, you know, maybe could be potential negotiating more on the, uh, at, at, at the, you know, with, let's say with the Briar and the, and the, you know, the Scotties and the season champion stuff. But I think when you look at, you know, the slams, they took a chance on curling. The Oh Rogers, yeah. They, they Rogers, took a risk. They Rogers took a risk and they knew, they knew that they wanted to be part of their, their, uh, their property and their package to offer. Cause they knew it was there for, you know, for TV and, and, you know, we're lucky for the 18 teams that, uh, that really fought hard, uh, you know, it'd be, I guess it'd be 17, 18 years ago for us. And, uh, and it keeps getting, you know, it keeps getting better and better. Um, I think there's still more, I, I think it, I thought actually the U S winning the Olympic gold yeah, she's would really help. I know it helped their numbers. I know they're growing in the States right now. But I feel like we need that to happen. We need it to grow even more um, in the U.S. and be and become this, you know, big venture, which I think would then uh, then trickle up to us. Um, but uh, it's until, good. yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> I'm not I'm not that worried. Um, okay. but, uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but uh, half kidding. Um, so no, like I, yeah, I, I'm surprised. I also think that like sponsoring a team right now, that's like such an easy investment too. With all the exposure and the reach that we get, it's pretty affordable to sponsor curling teams. So I think that, you know, really that, that should start to grow. And, and I, I think your best, but you know, your, your best buy for your buck right now is in, is, is a curling team to sponsor them. Yeah. You guys are NASCARs right now. It, it, we are. It's so true, right? Like, you know, we're <laughs> NASCAR covered. and we're fit. Like, come on. There you go. I remember that I can't, I can't, I couldn't tell you what year it was. And I, I think it was Asham who did it first. It might've been balance plus, but I think it was Asham the first year the Asham pants came with like just Asham on the knees on your sliding knee. I was like, that's genius. Every time someone slides out, it's Asham right beside the rock. Like it's, and that's, right? it's one, of our, that's, and that's one of the prime spots right now. People, you know, they, uh, you know, companies realize, you know, we have, been there dump that right on our uh on our leg when you slide out it's it's perfect you can just see it right there and you know up here on the shoulder as you're sliding out there's there's just so many great spots sweepers back like yeah there's lots of great angles for uh you know on on tv that that really uh that really pop uh, uh pop and, and and show up have you guys do you guys have like a management group i know there are teams now you're starting to see getting representation yeah. like and you're one of the top teams so yeah, we're super lucky to uh, have partnered with uh, 111 uh, Management Group, which uh, Jeff Dykeman looks after us. And uh, you know what? He actually, he's the, uh, speaking of comedians, he's the, he's the uh, agent for Jerry D. Um, oh, and, really? Uh, so we'll talk later. So after. I'll, I'll, I'll connect you and I'll get you. And, uh, and, and, you know, and so he's just done a great job at that the relationship side and, and finding ways that we can help and managing that and taking that off our plate before it was kind of as the skip, you were like the CEO of the team, the manager, the be doing this, that, the find the spot. So it's nice that, you know, he's there just to help the sponsor too and make sure that they're looked after and taking a little bit of pressure off us to just go out and play, you know, win games. And, and, and that just helps, helps everybody all around. So what a, what a great uh, partnership it's, it's been. And, and he's just, just brilliant with the ideas and, and finding ways and curling. You know what? You, you can be creative with, uh, you know, between the, between the team and the sponsor. And, and I think that's what I hope the sponsors like too. And, and uh, that's what we've tried to be. Speaking of pressure, like how, how do you prepare yourself mentally for something like the Briar? Where, where you're going to be actually playing in front of thousands of people live as well as, hundreds of thousands, if not a million people uh, on TV. Like how does, how do you mentally prepare for something like that? You know, you know what, I, you're, you're lucky as you like, you're playing, I played against EJ 20 years ago, but the nice thing <laughs> is because we've been playing against each other for so many years, maybe I put myself in a bit more tough spots than he has over the years of pressure games, but you keep banking on those past games, right? So all the times that I've been at Briar and the, and the slams and slam finals, and you just, you know, you can't, you can't buy experience. You really can't. And that's one thing for our team, especially for, you know, two guys on my team who have been in every big game possible. You know, 
I really rely on them to make sure that I'm, you know, I'm in a good headspace. You know, to be actually the biggest um, thing going into this uh, this past year's Briar in March was being the home province team. That added that added distraction of having all your family, all your friends, everybody's cheering for you. Everybody wants a piece of you that week, right? When it comes to media. Uh, as you're saying, seeing people and, and, and you got a bit of a target on your back against the teams too. So you just have to really understand that that distraction is going to be there and figure out how, how are you going to prevent that and, and make sure that, that you're not going to, uh, to fall into that and get pulled away. And, and that's what we did to make sure that as the, and as the skip, it's weird, like in curling, right? It's my last name is our team name, which, yeah. you know, is kind of weird. Right. And so, you know, as the skip, you tend to get a little bit more, uh, attention. So it's actually a lot of me getting pulled here and there and you just have to have the right people protecting you and your security there to make sure that uh, that you're looked after and you can focus on on winning because you know what your skip sucks has a bad week you're not going to win curling games. Yeah it's like a goalie right like last like if, if they're having a bad game it doesn't matter how the rest of you played right unfortunately. Yeah and where, where your defense can be awful goalie stands on their head and then you win the game. It's yeah. the same thing and it's yeah. the same Curling. Um, one of the things too, Mitch, for on that on that point, um, and I don't know if this is the same for you, John. Um, like when I went to junior nationals, it was the first time I played in an arena. Um, they had an arena there. I don't know if they did your year if you went. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a whole new world, right? You're 19 and you're like, what is happening? Um, I remember there was one day because I was in my juniors was in PEI and there was a um uh, like a school day game. So it was just a bunch of really loud oh, yeah. kids. <laughs> and so like you're learning to play with these ridiculous distractions. And I mean, it obviously for me, I didn't go on with the sport to the level John has, but like, that's just these weird little lessons you learn when you're a kid and odd for, for you, John, that would have been something you could take forward, right? You've been in that spot before. Well, exactly. And then it's just every, you know, it's that first, that feeling of your first grand slam final. Mm -hmm. that I had you know when I, I was playing did that early though I was I was playing second for Wayne Mada and, and that feeling of like whoa this is pretty awesome but then again I'm surrounded by Wayne Mada, John Mead, Scott Bailey that they're like okay okay kid we're gonna get you through this right yeah. and then and then the next time was I mean I think I skipped in my first slam final uh, a couple of years later and 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 that feeling I just remember like this is so cool and yeah you know, Mitch, I got caught up in it. I did. You get caught up and you're like, whoa, okay. And, and it sure did affect you. But then you learn from that and you keep building, building, building. And, and now it's, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's, let's, let's do this again. It's another curling game. And even though you want to win, I think sometimes now you want to win more than you did way back then. I, I don't know. I think as I'm getting older, I'm, you feel like you don't have as many chances down the line. And every game to me and every final I get into, I just want to win so badly because you just don't know how many times you're going to get back there. Don't you look at a guy like Glenn though and go like, maybe I got a few more years. Jeez. <laughs> My body can't handle that. You got to have a, you got to have a, a technical delivery like that guy does to be able to last as long yeah. as he can. And, and that's just uh, his, his technical uh, slide is just, it's, it's absolutely perfect. Doesn't break down ever. Doesn't break down. E easier on the knees. Not saying that he's. Yeah. I'm sure he's hurting, but but I mean just just. But you're real, up a bit and forward a bit, so. Yeah, definitely a bit of pressure, a little bit of a tucker, but I mean just how technical Glenn's yeah. slide is, and is yeah, it's 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 awesome. So, but I still wish he would retire because he's just like he's so tough to beat. It's crazy. No, it's uh, he's great. The rivalry we've had over the last. Uh, I'd say now probably 10 years has been, uh, it's been great and, and love playing Glenn. He's yeah, he's a great competitor. And, and the big thing, he's just a gentleman, just a classy guy. Every time I've interviewed him, he's been awesome. And he yeah. runs a beer store. Let's be real. I know. Right. But he's got to carry my beer. I don't know if he carries my beer there yet. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> gotta get my, gotta get, gotta get my beer there. Epic ale. Have you had it yet? No. no. You I didn't even my, know I, you had, I didn't even know you had a beer. What? Give wow. me a can. Let's go. Show me a can. Wow, where is my hat? Like, I don't even, I got my own beer. You don't have a, it's called Epic Ale with two Ps. Really? Where have you been? Come on. I, oh yeah, I got my own. I got, I, I'll, now I got to get you some. So, yeah, well, I'll, I'll find I have some. a curling, I have a curling beer, Epic Ale. I have and a they're at, like, ale. they're at beer stores. 
there uh, we we passed the first step so we're waiting to pass the second step hopefully we'll get in but right now we're we were in 40 curling clubs in ontario and uh and hopefully we're going to go Canada wide. We did a, a light Lagerdale last year and we're going to launch an Amber uh, for the fall, hopefully when curling's back. And, and yeah. It's so where, been, where can uh, I get it? Can I get local, it? Like, there's a local, it? local, local brewery in Leslieville in Toronto, right, right around the corner yeah. from where I live uh, called Radical Road. Uh, they have a bunch of, bunch of beers and, and I partnered with them and, and, and they, uh, yeah, we, we came up with, with Epic Ale. It's been That's an awesome. absolute, absolute blast. And, big thing for me is to support the curling clubs through this. So I, you know, help, help out with some curling clubs, do some tastings. And, uh, you know, I supported the, the travelers team or the, sorry, the club championship teams that represent Ontario, just, you know, stuff like that. Get, get it. Curling's given me so much. It's a great chance to, uh, to give back. So I definitely will get you, uh, get you some Epic ale. Yeah, that's killer. This yeah, is, I I'm I'm to have my hat around, but I usually have it. Go uh, find it. Go find it. it around. Where is we, it? um, We've had two curlers on now, Mitch. That both own their own brewery or own their own beer. <laughs> have their own beer. Like, yeah. Like as if, as if alcohol wasn't related directly yeah, to, to the curling. Sport. It, it, like, yeah. Was, if there's yeah, one there thing I'm taking like, away. Oh, it's even got the slide. I love it. Oh, well, that's nice. me. Come on. How do you no, know? No, I know. That's what you I mean. You know that slide, right? Like that's, that's, yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So it's been uh, absolute, uh, absolute blast. So that's I, you know I should have wore it tonight, but I thought I thought this was a pretty you know like classy, uh, classy show. So I wanted to make sure I did my COVID hair and, and look good for you guys tonight. So yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love that. And we like I I just think it's hilarious. It's wicked. Um, so one of the other things I want to talk to you about because it is uh, it is Pride Month and um, you know I've known you forever. Um, I had no idea uh, when we were teenagers uh, that you were gay. You might have been openly gay then. I don't know. I have no, no idea. I wasn't, I'm just no. oblivious to everything. <laughs> there's a few no. guys that we curled with, actually, that I now know. I'm not going to name names because it's not my yeah. place. But there's a few yeah. people in the tour when we were kids um, that are now out and, and doing their thing. And one of the things I always wondered, because, like, I know for sure I was a shitty teenager. Like, I'm not homophobic. I wasn't then. Yeah but I guarantee I would have said something stupid around a bunch of guys on a curling weekend. Right. Did you find that that existed or does exist or how was your experience in, in curling? Right. So I was, let's say a late, a late bloomer. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I've only, I've only been um, say out for 10 years now and, and in the, let's say in the curling community and publicly for curling community about seven years publicly, in the meet, meet that being media uh, got hold, and that's been about five years. Um, you know what? I I haven't experienced uh, too much. I mean, the odd, you know, the odd thing you you hear when you're traveling, and and not from one of the the competitors, but maybe you just hear it from anybody. Um, but no, the cur the curling community has been so supportive. When I came out, they were. You know, they, you know, most of the curlers want to reach out and, and touch base in some way by, you know, text, phone call, um, you know, in person just to say, you know, we, we support you, we got your back or just tried to like, we're all different in how we want to uh, have a, I don't want to say an awkward conversation, but express our feelings to somebody and, yeah. and basically tell them it's okay. And some of the things they would say just to relate to me and some of the stories, they, hey, remember this time we had the best time. And, you know, just to say like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're John, like, and that's, uh, you know, that was, that was great. And, and they, they still are supportive. And um, I, I have never come across any of the, any curler that's, uh, that's ever said anything that's, that's inappropriate. And maybe, maybe now they're, and maybe now they're more aware of it because I'm around, I'm not sure. Um, and if, I think if anybody did say something, somebody would, would step in as a, you know, a, another curler or, or colleague, you know, opposition friend would say, would say something. Um, but no, I, I haven't, uh, I've been super lucky and, and the curling, and as you know, curling is a, it's a very close knit community. And, um, and I, I really, uh, you know, I really appreciate that. And, and it's made it really easy for me to come out and tell my story and know that, you know, they're going to support me and I can continue to tell. It feels like I'm always actually telling my story right now these last couple of years, which is a great thing that it, it needs to be. I need to tell it more and more because I know it's helping. Um, it's helping others. And, and that's all I can. That's all I want to do is try and try and just help other people. Now, do you think that 
like that's awesome first off that's that's awesome that the community's been so supportive but do you think that that lack of community is what's preventing athletes from coming out in other sports there's a good chance yes i think um you know, I was just talking about this on a talk show about, uh, you know, that's funny that we're at, you know, about, uh, about, you know, being, uh, you know, gay in, in professional sports and the impact that, uh, you know, you know, that could have if, uh, if somebody came out and let, let's say in NHL, NFL, um, MLB, I think that uh, for them, it's, it's that I think is really tough is that locker room culture which there's that in curling because, you know, in curling, you're actually in all those sports, you're actually just in a locker room with your team in curling. You're actually in the locker room with all the other curlers, all your uh, opponents and the people you're going to play against. And um, I've never, I've never experienced anything that would make me feel uncomfortable or that moment where the room went quiet because somebody said something or, or I, I felt awkward or weird. Um, so, but that's speaking for me and I know that's not the case in other pro sports. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're probably a ways away from that happening, um, until, until, you know, some more things happen. And, and I think that, that, you know, can come from, from education, uh, starting with our youth to, you know, we talked about even tonight, but, but grassroots, maybe starting with the grassroots and being developed there so that it's just part of the conversation as you grow up um, in that, uh, in the, in the locker room and, and organizations. So I hope we'll get there, but uh, I'm not sure we're, we're going to get there anytime soon with a big, you know, the, a big name coming out. Yeah. It's, I think for curling and you tell me if I'm wrong, John, but um, yes, the locker room exists where it's literally a locker room where you get changed with the other team and then you go out on the ice and play. Um, but I mean, it's a little bit different now because some of the events are getting split up. But um, when I was younger, when you were younger, you know, men's and women's uh, were playing at the same place at the same time. Um, and the locker room for curlers uh, isn't just the locker room. Like you go back to the same hotel and there's a hospitality yeah. room and everybody, male, female, everybody's together. Um, so like that alpha mentality probably doesn't exist in that room because it's men and women together. Um, and that like ridiculous, I don't want to just pick a sport, but hockey, football, whatever, right? That ridiculous over, over the top masculinity ideology doesn't persist. And also, like, curling's such a weird, weird sport in that um, you literally go out and try to beat someone for two and a half hours. And then since you were 12 years old, you were taught to sit and have a drink with those same guys and, be respectful <laughs> yeah. and get to know them as people. Like, you're taught that at 12 years old in the sport. Yeah. So I think yeah. that might be different for curling as well. I agree 100%. And I think that it's not – we're not just that that high end big money uh you know sport too where there's just that it's just a very community feel and you you know and it's like your teammates too i you're on the road with them they're my four you know i call them brothers you know best friends i i've always had a team where if I, I need to make sure that i get along with all three that we enjoy each other's company cuz we spend more time together than we do at home um so an, an I mean, intense time together like oh, highs and lows exactly i mean hey it's it's when when things are great it's amazing right you're winning you win but you got to be able to handle losing together and and uh you know always realize that we're all trying out there um but uh you know i've been fortunate enough to have fantastic teammates and and i think you know that would probably have been the biggest worry coming out was more, you know, your teammates, you're, you're spending all this time and, you know, I'm, you know, there's, you know, your three straight teammates and John. So like, are you, is that change anything? Is it comfortable for me to, to be in that you're rooming together? You're spending like literally spending all your time with them. So. But I mean, again, with the curling community, um, I mean, sometimes teams change just because of personality conflict, sure. because of, ability level because of whatever but it's very infrequent that you're going to be adding a guy to your team that you haven't spoken to pretty extensively over 10 years it's so true yeah it's so yeah ex exactly you know the circle we all end up curling with each other and 
you know, and I might have been an advantage. Like, I'm a skip. Like, you can't get rid of the skip, can you? Like, I don't know. I'm just kidding. Well, I guess all three of them <laughs> could go. I, I guess, guess they I could. Know. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> See it. See a skipper. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's, it's different, right? What, how are you, um, how are you dealing with COVID right now? Because actually, I don't even know. Do you have the same team next year? I haven't paid attention since the Briar because life has been. That's a- well, yeah, you know what? Like, we haven't really had many phone calls, so I'm gonna take that as a good thing. I haven't got the like the phone call, like, "Hey, like, what's up?" And then, you know, so I think we're good. I think we're locked in for. But uh, no, I you know, team mapping is uh, is intact, and you know, it's been challenging times. My poor my poor husband has seen more of me than he has in probably our 10 years together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm never home. And now like we live in a 550 square foot condo and, uh, you know what it's, uh, I give him credit for putting up with me, but, um, you know, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a big change for me business wise, you know, beer, beer stopped, all my coaching and teaching stopped and all my curling stopped. So it was a bit of a weird thing for me to all of a sudden, kaboom, everything stopped, but trying to stay, uh, trying to stay fit and find things to, uh, to keep in shape at my age and, and keep the mobility going so I can, you know, last as long as Glenn. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I took up the guitar, thought I'd try and, and start to play the guitar a bit. And, uh, and, and yeah, just, uh, trying to oh i'm getting my i'm trying to get my smart serve so that i can serve my beer so yeah it's been uh yeah it's been it's been it's been okay but trust me i'm looking forward to uh to seeing the guys again and, and getting back and, and competing and uh you know that's uh that's why i play I, I love being on the ice and i love i love winning winning's fun well, i think anyone at the level you're at that's why you're playing right you love the yeah. winning like that's the, the that's the drug that's the drug you're chasing right Oh, it's so true. Winning, winning is winning. As, as Wayne Madai used to say, yeah, winning is so much better than not winning. So it's that, <laughs> it's that easy. It's that easy. Such a good quote for like, <laughs> especially for this podcast. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you've got a bunch of good wins, um, right? Like you talked about, like you've won some slams. Um, you know, you've won the Ontario Tankard a few times. You've come close in another. What, what's your what's your win? The 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 Mount Rushmore right now, the big win, the one that was the biggest oh, in your career so far. Oh man, man, oh man, oh man. Oh, I, think. I would. Um, oh, that's a really hard question because now you're taking me back to all those wins and i'm thinking about them and the, you think about the feeling you have right exactly. that ontario win that first one that feeling was so here and then i'm not gonna lie i hit the dressing room and i just had the biggest sigh because i was so relieved to finally win because i'm supposed to win i'm supposed to you know win a bunch of ontarios and i haven't won yet pressure is building so that win felt like that was the biggest relief i've ever had um, but that win of, of that first Grand Slam when I had, uh, when I was skipping, when we won in PEI, we were the last seed in the event out of the eight teams. And you had Howard Martin, Stoughton, Gushu, uh, McHugh and Cooey. And we went through the field and uh, I remember the semifinal we beat Martin and we were down two nothing after the first end. And his record up after he took two in the first end was something like, 90 and one and, and, two. and we and now he's 90 and two because of it when we we came back and uh and won that game and then we beat uh, we actually ended up beating glenn and uh, wayne in the in the final but that that win was was just just so special as a skip it kind of felt like a big breakout and uh just yeah that that yeah it was a pretty uh pretty incredible feeling when you win a when you win a spiel like that, a spiel, it's not a stupid way to put it, but when you, <laughs> um, but like, honestly, no one can question you as a skip ever again, right? Like you can get to a certain level and people will still doubt you, but even just one win like that, no one can doubt you as a skip again. Yeah, it, it, it's true. I, I think so. And then, you know, sometimes, and especially in a field like that. To yeah, get through a I mean. field, to get through a field with the top, you know, there's eight teams in the world, and it's that's one of the toughest ones to. You know, I mean, it's not like there's a couple of the top teams there, and you you squeak might only have to play one or two of them, but you got to play every one of them, and then you got to beat the number one and number two team in the world in the 
playoffs. So yeah, that was, that was, and then just the next slam we won in, uh, I, I think a couple of years later was, was just big to just solidify. So, okay, now, now I can feel that more things are coming and then, you know, to win another one and just that the win a key, the win a slam slams are super tough to win other than the Olympic. I say the Olympic trials and the slams based on how deep the field is, right? The, the Olympic trials is crazy because it's just, it is the top you know, nine teams in the country playing down. Right. And then, and then in the, in the slams it's your top 15 in the world. So it's uh, yeah, they're, they're both extremely, extremely tough to win a little more pressure on the trials. Cause who doesn't want to, uh, who doesn't want to wear that maple leaf at the Olympics with uh, you know, with everybody in the country, just, you know, supporting you. Was, um, was Ryan, Ryan was on the team with Jacobs when they went to the Olympics. Yeah, they won in, in Sochi in 2014. Yeah. And then Langer, Langer went in 2018. He went to the last one with Cooey. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, so you got guys around you that have... Guys I've, that have just won, a, just won a few things. But yeah. you know what? But it, in, I, I, think, I think for them, and, and we are the oldest, it was thrown on TV this year at the Canada Cup when we won. We are the oldest average age team on tour. Because you don't have that very, real young front end. Um, we don't. No, I've got a 41-year-old or 42-year-old at, at lead, right? And then Matt just turned turned 30. Um, so, but I think what's I think what's in the favor of 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 a Langer and Fry is I'm somebody that's obviously been around a while, but I don't still have some of those wins, and I'm still hungry. And and I know they're hungry too, but they're playing with some with a guy that's been around, and he's still really hungry for I want a briar I want you know Olympic trials like so I want more slams I've only got four of them I want more so I think being I think they're in that right they're with me a guy that's still really hungry and uh you know for wins it's I think it it, it plays in their favor what drives you what started the wanting to win stuff right like where's your where's yours come from um I I think it comes from I I love the feeling of uh, pressure. I love competing. Um, I think I'm super, I'm stupid competitive in everything I do. I actually know that I can't stand losing more than I like winning. Yeah. I actually, I like winning, but I know I can't, I it, it, like, I don't like the word hate. So I don't like to say it, but I actually like, I hate losing <laughs> more, than I, more than I like winning. What is the worst loss for you? Oh. <laughs> really want to go there. Um, you know what? Um, I would say um, probably the one – I had one provincial final um, just a couple of years before I won that it just felt like our year. Everything felt like it was going together at the provincials and it was right down to the wire. And then we kind of lost on a heartbreaker. Uh, Glenn made a pistol to win. And I think that one was, that was really tough. Um, Cambridge. Uh, uh, no, where it was, was over that? there? It was, that where, was in, where, is in Brantford. Where, yeah. Where Gretzky's from. I was yeah. at that. I was Were at, you there? Yeah. And uh, yeah, that was the whole year the the broom. Debacle. remember the broom debacle with the, the hair broom and the crazy heads and yeah that was a tough one and then you know what and then to be honest the next year the next year I think it was Mitch or maybe two years later I think the win that I actually went it's weird you're like number seven we're just number seven in the world but I actually had the rock bottom moment where I felt like what am I gonna do after this and it was the next provincial we didn't win and uh, I just had that moment of like you know, yeah, it was rock bottom. Like, what am I going to do? Where am I going now? Like, I'm, I'm, you know, we're pretty good, but like, gosh, we can't break through. And I had to like take the help of, of my family. One of my family members, my aunt, who is a life coach and approached me and said, when you're ready, I'd love to help you. And uh, I said, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> like, I just, like, I need it. Like, you just saw what happened. And, uh, and she actually, you know, didn't give me, wasn't easy on me because we were, you know, we were family, but she really worked hard with me and worked hard with my team the next, uh, the next couple of years. And, and yeah, that was, that was a, that was a tough one. That was a tough one, but she, uh, yeah, really, really helped and pulled me through and, and, uh, you know, has, has made me a, a better curler now, a better, a better person in general. Uh, just, you just, I feel like, uh, you know, when I say better, I just say like a great, uh, just a healthy mindset in, in not only in life, but on the ice. I think whatever happens in your, 
however you feel in life and, and, and all that thing, I think it really can carry on to the ice and how you, what happens on the ice can carry on, can carry into, into your everyday world. And uh, I think that was starting to happen with curling and just, yeah, it was a crazy reboot. I think I, oh my God, that like, even for stand up comedy, John, we like quite often say the same words in the same order in different places, right? Like we're doing the exact same five minutes, but if you had a shit day and you go up and you try to tell your shit jokes, it just doesn't, you know, you can say the same words in the same order three days before, but you're in a good mood. You hit the right notes, you kill. And then you go up and people just look at you like, what are you saying? You stupid idiot. Cause you yeah. bring those emotions with you, right? Like it, it, you, it's really hard to turn it off. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. And then, yeah, that's the, the danger too, as we start to get better and better at curling, we put all our, we're putting all our eggs into one basket too. And, you know, it's, uh, I find what's helped me in the last, I would say three, four years too, is, is finding balance in other, other areas, especially in the coaching side and the, and the teaching side and, and the beer side. And, uh, I think it's funny, I'm busier, I'm way busier than before. It's like, you know, it's crazy busy. But I find that busyness and that other stuff is giving me a better balance in the, in my in my life. Uh, yeah, I agree with that too. Because I um, obviously haven't I didn't have the ex- success uh, in curling that you did. Um, but I like when I was nineteen, I identified as a curler, right? Like it was yeah. who I was as a human being, as a and as a person. And then you know, juniors was done. I had my success. Tried men's for two years in Nova Scotia, but was at university. Was drinking too much wasn't working. Right. And I I had to say like, okay, what am I going to do here? I ended up running a curling club for a few years. um, And then I was like, wait, this, this sport I loved, this thing I loved has now become this job I hate. Right. Um, And so I'm ruining the thing I love to try to hang on to this identity of being a curler. And I had to just be like, all right, like I need to just do this. It can't, it can't be all who I am. It can't be all encompassing. And I think for anything anyone does ever in life, like being a stand-up comedian, it can't be everything. I have to also be a dad and a husband and like a good friend. And like, I have to work hard to like pay my bills. Like you can't, you just can't be just one thing. I don't think it's good for your noodle. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I think, and that's especially, I was, I was definitely feeling that or maybe not even aware. I wasn't aware of that. Um, But you know, be, became aware. And I actually, I, I think that when I fully had my kind of just come to moment was just with this, this coaching gig that I've been doing, like, you know, I'm just doing, I'm thinking this just feels so right and everything around it. And, and yeah, I could just, I could just feel that, uh, you know, that balance and, and, uh, and happiness and not just thinking about chasing points every week. Yeah. And, and I still, like, I, curled i love curling i watch a lot of curling could not could not do the math on those things <laughs> lee yeah yeah you just i went in doubt i just you know message somebody and say hey so what does this mean did i do we have enough points okay good thanks yeah okay. you just go to the website and be like i guess i'm in fourth now i just yeah or i just know that like you know winning i just know winning's a good thing and winning probably means you're going to be near the top and you know yeah Winning's good. Winning. Winning's good. Winning's Winning. great. So what are you going to win this year? <laughs> it's a great one. Everything. Oh, there you Everything. go. Everything. You, you, I'm at the point. I'm at the point now where I just want to win games, win games, win games. And don't get thinking about, I got to win this and I got to win that. And I got to win this. Uh, like I said, the balance is there. I love, I love playing with the guys that I, that I've got. We enjoy ourselves. We like winning together. Uh, I love competing out there. I still feel like uh, I've got a lot in me, a lot of years in me. And, um, and yeah, I still love working hard at the game too. I really, I really like putting the time in. I like practicing, you know, Fry lives in Toronto. I actually just moved into my neighborhood. Uh, I didn't realize he liked me that much. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what? It, it's, it's been, uh, you know, it's awesome to have him close and, and we can work together and, and work hard together. And, and we've been practicing now for a year because he's been in Toronto for, for just over a year. And all right, we've got our practices down. They're pretty efficient and, uh, and, and we get the job done together. And, and yeah, I just, uh, I look forward to winning lots in the future. 
Um, one of the things uh, I love about uh, curling and, and you, John, is, you know, we played as kids against each other uh, and then life takes you where it takes you. And it was probably 15 years between times I saw you uh, back at Trillium um, and we were both coaching. Uh, and it was like, it's just, it, it's, it's just, it's like nothing happened in yeah. 15 yeah. years. Everyone just hangs out. You've got this common core um, uh, of curling that, that links you. And, um, I love that, uh, you've got a beer. I love that you're winning. Uh, I love that you're happy. Um, thank you, thank you so much, uh, for coming on and talking to us, buddy. Um, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you I so really, much. Uh, I, yeah, I really appreciate it guys. Thanks so much. Stay healthy. Yeah. You too, buddy. Stay, uh, stay healthy in your 500 square foot. <laughs> <laughs> Stay alive. Stay yes. alive. Stay alive. Good luck this year, man. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Cheers. Yeah, it's fun. Okay. I, I cannot express enough how much I love that both curlers have their own beer. That was such a nice surprise Just for, for that. Rock the stereotype as yeah. hard as humanly possible. Yeah. Just uh, like when he said like, oh, yeah, I got my own beer. And he's saying it like, you didn't know I had my own beer? Like, we all have our own beer. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I curl. We have beer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he had a cool logo and stuff. I want yeah, I like the logo. I don't know what my logo would be, though. It would be me, like, drinking his beer instead of, like, fighting. <laughs> <laughs> me. Yeah, it looked like that. Yeah, except not in a plastic. Not in a tumbler. Yeah, we have all these because because we have the pool, right? Uh, uh, no glass out there, so I just oh, in the summer I just drink out of plastic so that if I have to walk out there, it's I don't have to. Makes sense. You don't have yeah. to switch glasses. I don't anything. even know where my glass cups are right now because I just, yeah. just don't need them. And I buy time. beer in cans because mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can just bring that out there. The bottle, right? My dad hates it so much. Really? Yeah, because he's old school, right? Like he thinks the can affects the beer somehow well the can done. does affect the beer somehow he probably I wants sorry don't think, i don't think whatever he's drinking is going to be Coors like yeah Coors, that's my point is the it doesn't matter we say like oh i don't <laughs> like drinking other cans it's always like what do you drink a budweiser you're fine you can <laughs> drink it out of a wine cask you're not going to notice any impurities or imperfections in your in your piss beer don't worry about it. You're drinking it because it's 5.5% and goes down easy. We all know yeah. the deal. It's yeah. fine. We're not judging you for it, but understand what you're doing. You know that old joke, how's Coors Light like having sex in a canoe? Both close to water. Both fucking close to water. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm so close. <laughs> you're a comedian. You should know that one. That's, I know. That's, that's, that's a like basic. That's it's a, a classic party joke. Classic. Right? Somehow I to get a good cup of coffee in Toronto. I don't know this one. Oh, it's because Montreal has all the cups. <laughs> oh, <poo. laughs> it's pretty funny though. I laughed. <laughs> I love those party jokes, like the street yeah. jokes. Yeah. All right. That's, that's there, there's fewer and fewer of them that you can say now though, which is a good thing. There's well, because they're like wildly racist or yeah, or or transphobic or yeah homophobic or yeah and here it's funny because comedy's changed so much right so like when i was a kid i had an uncle who used to tell jokes like he was a jokester it's what he did but comedy for like that generation was like a two minute setup for a punch right yeah. it's like a big winding tail yes. for one big punch Right. And now comedy has to be like, no, no, no. You need like tags and hits throughout the whole thing or I'm bored with you. Right. But it was yeah. just a totally, they would, they would, they were trying to catch your attention. And then when they finally had you, they, that's when the, the flip would come. Right. And they yeah. do it totally different. It's and it always ended. And you would think to yourself, like, cause I had uncles who tell those kind of jokes and, and it, you'd always think like, well, I don't think Pollocks are that dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got that, whatever, yeah, race whatever, uh, whatever they went for at the time. They always seemed to end with blonde, blonde jokes. jokes were big when I was growing up. Newfie jokes. I never, I hadn't met a newfie until I was in my 20s, but as a kid, 
the my version of what a newfie was was not very well informed wildly skewed <laughs> wildly uh what's the one uh there's like three guys on an island they get stranded on an island there's a guy from ontario a guy from quebec and a guy from newfoundland and uh they get stranded on an island and there's cannibals on the island and the cannibal will say like just so you know you're all gonna die like that doesn't matter it's but it's happening <laughs> what we'll do is we'll let you choose the way you die. And they have uh, different things on a, on a buffet table and they have like a gun and they have poison and they have knives and things like this. And uh, the Ontarian picks up the, the gun and he says, well, if I'm going out, I want it to be quick. And he shoots himself in the head. And then the others watch the cannibal skin the Ontarian into a canoe and then sail off on the canoe. And then the uh, the next guy, the the Quebecois, picks up poison and and says, uh, uh, I, "If I'm going out, I'm going out drinking." And he drinks the poison and he dies. And then they skin him and turn him into a canoe and they they sail away. And the Newfie's standing there and they're like, "Well, what do you, what do you want?" And and he he grabs a fork. And they're like, "Fork?" He goes, "You're not making a canoe out of me." <laughs> See, it's, it's funny. Those jokes are funny. Those funny. jokes are funny, but it's the stupidest. <laughs> Some of like the first jokes I remember are like, this is awful. Do you remember Helen Keller jokes? Of course. Like just, I remember being 15 laughing hysterically, like such an idiot. Yeah. Like that these are the funniest things ever. Cause this yeah. woman's blind and deaf <laughs> yeah. and mute. Yeah. Like what? there's nothing so bad there's nothing funny about it no but, but your sense you're of humor 15, is not developed oh it's the the dead the, baby the jokes. Like jokes were dead baby jokes and frank jokes yeah like all of it right and they were like commonplace i mean everyone had them especially dead baby jokes everyone yeah, like had if you brought jokes. your family ones up someone else's family had different ones <laughs> yeah some another family like oh yeah well my uncle told me you know yeah yeah and i can't say some of them but my uh, family did the, uh, um, oh Jesus, uh, I'll get get back to you on this. Uh, that's what she said. That's what they. But they did it back in the day. But they always used to say that's what she said at the bell uh, picnic. I don't know why. But, at the bell picnic. Yeah, like that's the bell Canada picnic. Weird. It, yeah, like so. If you said something dirty. So right? yeah, someone, someone, you guys, like your family Indian knows Indian. who worked at Bell, like just like some dirty whore, like just said something. Did some? I can't even say dirty whore. I don't think actually. Now I think about it. No, that would be Slut profiling shaming. in some way. Yeah. I mean, I think we're better off for it. We are. That's just it. Is is we are because the truth of the matter is, if you have to rely on those types of jokes. You're not that funny to begin with. Correct. Like, well, I can't remember if it, who it was I read or heard. They said if your punchline's a swear word, it's not a funny joke. So like I don't I know. Will, Kick her in the pussy is one of the greatest punchlines. Yeah, but she he could have said kick her in the crotch and he still would have got there. No, no, kick her. It's gotta be pussy. It's it's that, a wild, but it's not even I don't know, because that's such a good joke because he makes you forget that he already told you the punchline. Right. Like that's right. the whole joke. Right. Um, but so like, you know, I swear when I'm on stage, but I always, when I write, I don't swear. I write it clean so that. I'm trying to do that more. I'm trying to, our conversation with Fiona got me thinking a lot about that. A like lot. how she created a set and how yeah. it, yeah. How everything the, the, tracks and like no callback thing. I was like, oh no. Yeah. Cause I I saw that when I was editing and I saw your reaction to that again of like, <laughs> no, no, no. Like <laughs> I love callbacks. Yeah, they're like the <laughs> easiest laugh. They're free laughs. Yeah. They're free laughs. Normally I don't really do them from bit to bit, luckily. I was thinking about that this week. Um, but I do have a few callbacks, right? But so I mean, I callbacks a, can work in a special, like if you think of... Yeah, uh, totally, totally. Somebody's shit on the coats. I don't know why I went to Dane Cook, but that's yeah, a callback he does. That's an old one. Yeah. Most, almost, 
maybe not a closer, but before they get into their closing bit, there's usually like a callback to something. Yeah. Or yeah. something. Yeah. But Depends. yeah, it, it was interesting. And I, um, it, it makes you think about what you have to do, right. In terms of actually producing a comedy album, um, which was like, I thought was super interesting. Mm-hmm. So, well, I'm sure a lot of our listeners, uh, uh, comedian did. yeah or me. did find it entertaining you mean yeah fun and entertaining yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, there's just it's little like you know dude we're we're in this we write it we are on stage performing it and you know you, we're still learning things right like she still said stuff that you're like fuck yeah that makes sense and um, i'm sure there's something that she's gonna hear that's gonna make her have the same reaction like you never stop no exactly exactly like, keep learning Constant yeah. improvement, baby. Constant. Yeah. That's why we're doing this podcast too, right? We do this to get better, get better at talking, meet new people. Hell, I've got to hit up John for his for his beer agent buddy. <laughs> oh, and his agent buddy, yeah, <laughs> Dude, he's agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he said that, like, oh, what's what's the guy's name? Uh, oh, he does Jerry D. He's okay. Yeah. yeah, he's he's doing all right for himself, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, he does some things. Yeah, just a few, just uh, just a few like national tours, you know. Uh, One of the biggest sitcoms in Canadian TV right now. I think it. That, I think it I just ended. If, actually, yeah, I think that ended. But Family seven seasons feud now. or something. What? Family Feud now. Oh, that's right. He is doing Family Feud now. Yeah, can the Family Feud, which yeah. is for you a step up because you love game shows. Oh fuck man uh the hosting a game show like like what david green should be doing yeah uh or will be doing one day i i I think uh yeah that that's that's the next step being a panelist though that's that's the dream for me well you love match game right match game or or hollywood squares i was actually um you know what screw those those games suck man i'm on team all those british shows but go on i just interrupted you sorry we could do because of gallery view of Zoom. We could, could do Hollywood, do squares. Hollywood squares and just have the where would the the contestants be? The contestants would be a different, uh, basically because you could do it by pages. So one page would be your your panelists, and then the next page would be your contestants. We could do a that lot. with local dudes. You could. It would be a lot of work to control all that. But uh, good. Now that I got pro, man, I, I feel like you'd be I, muting and unmuting. No, you would leave open the 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 contestants or the yeah. panelists, and the contestants and the host, and then mute everyone else. Mute the audience, and then you record it. And oh, you're record. gonna have a live audience too? Fuck yeah, you're gonna have a live audience. Relax. No many people would tune into that. You, you gave me the idea when you sent me what was it, Brantford doing the family feud. It was pretty or, cool, right? It was cool. That's what gave me the idea. I was like, yeah, that. Let's do Hollywood Squares because Hollywood Squares is such a great concept. Eight out of ten cats does yeah. countdown, or eight out of ten cats, or would I lie to you? I love would I lie to you too. Have you seen would that? I lie to you is pretty great. What yeah, they, so you could something. do that with with zoom easy we could yeah we could just steal those formats i would love to do qi you could do qi too i would i would love to, to steal i'm getting QI's more format. into qi it bothers me but i am oh, but the so one good. the one with the lady host uh susan Tosk- Tosk- yeah, because she's funny he, the other guy was too too much you don't food. like stephen fry no, oh. i mean he's crazy smart like i was i get it but right you, a little yeah, she, dry for she, me. She had some entertainment. Like, did you see the one where um, Jimmy Carr is one of the panelists and there's like a balloon on set and he's like, oh, stand there. It looks like a Banksy. And she's just standing holding this red balloon with like a stern <laughs> face on. It was so funny. Just like the worst I haven't seen it. I'm going to look it up. Now, actually, Facebook will just show it to me now that we've talked. Yeah, yeah. Now that we've talked, uh, it's going to be the first thing I turn my phone. I was ranting about this the other day, actually. Uh, about what happened with, uh, what was it, George Carlin? Uh, oh, yeah, because we talked about it on this podcast. Yes. Yeah, we talked about George and Carlin then, being clean kit, clean cut. And then that before night, I got to bed, you texted mm-hmm. me. Yeah. I, I My phone had been like, hey, you want to watch this video of George Carlin in a suit? <laughs> I was like, but, but they're not listening. 
No, no, of course not. No, of course not. What there was something else that happened where I was like, who was who was like the third the third baseman of the Jays like uh in two thousand two or something like that? I was trying to figure out. Troy Gloss. Could have been. All I know is when I pulled up my phone and typed into letter three, it auto filled third base for the Jays. And I was like, God damn it. They know everything about us. Which I don't I don't mind that they know everything about us. I just hate that they throw it in our face. <laughs> yeah, like they're pretending that they don't, but they Yeah, they're <laughs> it, yeah, they're at the same time, like every time I want to search something, if I say it out loud, it'll be like, oh, no, I'm sure you mean you Yeah. Know. That's why um I don't get the microchip thing. Well, so you you're talking about what Sad Powers talked to you about on on his. Well, podcast. and it's just out there, right? The whole Bill Gates conspiracy thing. So here's here's my my thought on the microchip. Okay, why I wouldn't get it. Your phone in your pocket, right? Amazing piece of technology, incredible, powerful, getting better getting well that's just it in two years this is dog shit <laughs> paper well i'm not putting something in my brain <laughs> oh that's that gonna be two dog shit years <laughs> is gonna be dog shit do i have to go to the mall and have some like geek squad agent like cut open my head to replace it every two years like a cell phone that's gonna be the death of apple because what, what you're because you're gonna need like a CPU type setup where you can upgrade individual pieces as you go. Yeah. Instead of like the Apple product, which is like the one all in one. Yeah, like if you have an iPhone 11, right, the latest iPhone, it's amazing, it's incredible. But if yeah. I gave you an iPhone one and was like, "This is what you have to use," you would stab me with it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Well, it wouldn't run anything useful in today's world. It would barely be a phone and then would be nothing else. It would like teach you Spanish, but no one speaks Spanish anymore. It would teach you like, an, uh, it, would, it wouldn't even teach you Spanish. It would teach you like Esperanto, that, that universal language that no one learned. Never even heard of it. Oh, Esperanto. It was like um, someone tried to make a universal language that would be the easiest to learn from any language. So it's called Esperanto. It's based off the romance languages um and it's it's kind of a cool concept but no one has cool, any motivation to you to learn it. A, uh, essentially a fake language like you yeah. have to get the klingon people to, <laughs> to learn it because they're the, or the elvish the the tolkien types and there but there's yeah there's nothing to be gained from it well you could theoretically talk to the other person who learned it like that would be your only advantage yeah but what yeah that's what i'm saying your motivation is no like the world works by you learn the language that you're you learn as a child and then you need some sort of reason to learn something else right yeah. eventually the world may have one language but that's going to be based on which country wins uh, QI actually had that as one of their answers which was what will be the the language of the future and yeah, it's mandarin uh, no, it's um, it's essentially bad English. <laughs> it's essentially like like not slang, but like mispronounce. Like well, that's how language works, though, isn't it? Like that the words is. We think are properly pronounced, aren't? Are they? Well, when we say like foreign words, yeah, no, we're. What even English words? Haven't we like mutated those? Oh, over time, yeah, yeah. of course, yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. But it's 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 some sort of type of English that it's essentially going to be the thing, the the language of the future. It's bad English. My buddy um, in university spoke like he grew up in a French house, like his mom's French. Um, I don't know if he went to school in a French school or not. Doesn't matter. Um, but by the time we were at university, he had been living away for a few years, um, so his French was kind of jarbled. So I used to call it like franglais because mm-hmm. he'd like be talking to his mom and say like, Jay Fale dans la ditch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like that was, I don't know what's happening right now. Right. But, uh, and then, well, by the, he can't speak French at all anymore. Now he can listen to it, but it's been 25 years. Right. My dad's like that. My dad's first language was French and now it's completely gone. Yeah. 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 That's It's weird how language works. Right. And the brain, the noodle, it's not that, it works kind of when we want it to sometimes for moments. And then it lets us, it always lets us down, Mitch. 
it's always going to let you down. That's a happy thing to end on, I think. Yeah, that's it's a good positive note. The brain, the brain will, unless, you do you have a funny YouTube video you want to share with us? Uh, let's see what I got. You always seem to have something good. Um, I've been I tried kinda... to find that mutant that we were watching, kid. The, the kid. I couldn't find it. I've been kind of TikToking lately, watching some of the TikTok stuff. Um, Mr. David like... Green hit a million uh, views. Yeah, on one... Do you ever watch Hot Ones? Hot Ones? Hot Ones. I was already eating spicy wings. No, I've never actually seen it. Some of them are pretty good because you've got like guys talking a lot of smack and then they're crying by the end. Basically, I like watching people fall down. Who the fuck is this? I don't know. I just sorry, I just got like a Facebook notification like this person liked the thing and I was like we're not uh, we're not friends and then it turns out we are friends and then I'm like who the fuck are you? <laughs> Can you hear it? Yeah. Just people falling. That's amazing. Oh, like Oh. Yes. Yes. Break. Break. There it is. Oh, when your wife's making fun of you too, that's amazing. Oh. Like, where do you find this stuff? Like, where would you? Oh, you're cut. Where would you even buy that item? You make it. Oh, I couldn't make that. Oh, yes, drive them right into something. These aren't as extreme as they need to be. No, yeah. Oh, I like that. This is labeled as clumsy fat people falling down. Oh, that one was pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, let's see what else we got here. Now you're going to see like all of what I... Oh, gymnast, gymnastics fail. Some of these are real bad. When they like run run into the... Uh, yeah. Worst these thing. have like broken bones and... Clavicles. Shit. Yeah. Oh, that's, these people are just like... Oh, this is so disappointing. YouTube's letting me down. Well, you're also going by the worst fails at the Olympics. Best <laughs> fails ever. Oh, yes. Crush her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> again. Oh, I was hoping it was going to crush her again. Yes. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh you're. Yeah. Yeah. Saw that coming. Saw that coming. Oh, no. Get some hot water. Oh, that's not even funny. That's yeah, that, that could be potentially stop. damaging. Yes. Oh, please. Yes. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my. <gasps> he might be dead. Oh, uh, these oh, are these great. are great. I love these. Oh. <laughs> Like seven feet oh. on her face. <laughs> nice, nice. Is gonna, oh yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. It's the little things. All right, buddy. Oh All right. no, you're gonna. No, it's just a cat oh. looking at camera. That's not interesting. That's disappointing. Yeah. This Attacker. Biter. Biter foot. <laughs> oh, mom. Uh -huh. That's gonna. Oh, that was going to break butt. and smack him in the balls. Oh, oh. That would hurt so much. <laughs> You're going down. <laughs> <laughs> why would anyone bring... I, I don't... Why would people bring their dogs? I had my dog in my wedding. Okay. I'm We're going to so talk about that next week. <laughs> 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 okay. I want uh, a wedding picture next week with the dog in it, please. Absolutely. Bring it. Absolutely. All right, buddy. All right. It was fun. Talk to you tomorrow. You too.